Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Medal of Honor Heritage Center's next installment on our webinar series. Uh, today, we'll be talking about the Civil War defenses of Washington uh, and the Battle of Fort Stevens and a Medal of Honor recipient, William Ray. Uh, today, we're joined by Stephen Fan with the National Park Service. He is a National Park Ranger, one of the best that I know, uh, and I'm happy to have him on. Uh, Steve, welcome aboard. Good to see you, Stephen. It's a uh... Pleasure, as always, my friends, and it's good to have the Middle Tennessee State connection um, going coast to coast and hopefully yes, it is. as well. So I appreciate the invite. Look awesome, forward to yeah. talking about William Ray and, and the Battle of Fort Stevens and the defenses of Washington. Now, before we get into that, can you give us a little bit of an introduction on yourself and your career? Because I've been following your career since we first met at Middle Tennessee State University, and I think that that is a wonderful thing that people need to hear about. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. Uh, you know, I call, call it my history journey. And I guess, you know, we met at Middle Tennessee State. I've been on this pursuit of this career in the National Park Service. And, you know, everywhere from I started as an intern at Gettysburg National Military Park back in 2012 and then did another internship at Richmond National Battlefield Park in 2013. I uh, went to graduate school where I met you at uh, Middle Ten Tennessee State and started doing, you know, seasonal positions. I interned at Stones River National Battlefield at which I know you're closely affiliated with. And, um, you know, I got my first permanent job in D.C. at the Civil War Defenses of Washington, worked there for about four years. It's near and dear to my heart. You know, the battle anniversary just occurred about, about a week ago, over a week ago. And now I'm currently at Camp Nelson National Monument, one of the newest National Park Service units established in late 2018. I've been there since about uh, early 21, and I did a detail there for about 120 days. And I've been there permanently since September of 21. So I served as the chief of interpretation. And it's a really, really unique, complex site. And we hope the viewers here can come check it out at some point. Um, very, um, very, very complex as a Civil War site in Kentucky. A U.S. Army base, a recruitment center for over 10,000 African-American soldiers, a refugee camp for enslaved people, and also unionists es escaping Confederate occupation and things like that. So we're right in the middle of central Kentucky, uh, just south of Lexington. Uh, come out and see us. It's a really, really special site, and we're building a new national park site. So just look us up. Just look up Camp Nelson National Monument. And, uh, yeah, love to have you come and visit the park. Absolutely. I look forward to coming up there one day very soon. You got it. Uh, well, if you would like, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen and we can get this presentation underway. All right, my friend. So, you know, I was thinking about how to properly do this, right? Because I've given, obviously, a lot of presentations about the defenses of Washington, this elaborate system of earthen fortifications that was constructed during the Civil War to protect the national capital. And then, you know, I know this is obviously the Medal of Honor Heritage Center and there's a Medal of Honor recipient who you mentioned, William Ray. So I, I do a kind of a small, short general overview of the defenses of Washington. We'll talk about the Battle of Fort, Steve, uh, Fort Stevens and William Ray, who I think, uh, I know is obviously a Medal of Honor recipient, but you know, I think uh, this is a great opportunity to promote and share his story and his sacrifice and his courage. Um, and it's really, really important for us to do this. So again, really happy to be here. And yeah, let's get this going. And so I'm going to share the screen here. We'll start from the top. And so I'll call this extraordinary heroism, um, Sergeant William Ray in the Battle of Fort Stevens. So uh, let's get started with this. And so I said, I'm going to talk about the defenses of Washington, which was established in 1861. I guess, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of the Battle of First Bull Run or Manassas. And, uh, you know, that battle will have a major impact on the growth and development of the defenses of Washington, you know, but this really goes back to the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin in November of 1860, you know, by December and the early months of 1861, you have Southern states seceding from the union, forming the Confederacy and the national capital is under actually immediate threat, you know, to the North is Maryland, to the South is Virginia. And um, it's, kind of in the bottom of the bowl, as I like to describe it. The rim of the bowl is all this high ground around the Capitol, where these forts will be eventually constructed. Uh, Lincoln, as we know, will be uh, peacefully inaugurated on March 3rd, 1861. And, you know, he takes office at a very, very uh, dangerous time, um, dramatic time for the United States. And, you know, within a month, we've got the Confederate firing on Fort Sumter, the start of the Civil War, 
And you know, this quote comes from you know, the, the general in chief himself, Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, in a meeting with Lincoln in his cabinet, uh, who says, you know, the capital can't be taken. And at that time, um, the defenses of Washington comprise soldiers, uh, the regular U.S. Army, just small elements of them, a lot of D.C. militiamen, uh, men that were affiliated with the Republican Party that were there to basically guard government buildings. And, um, you know, as the war escalated, uh, so did the expansion of the defenses of Washington. And it happens quite rapidly. There's one field Scott. Yeah. This happens pretty quickly, as I mentioned. Uh, so in May of 1861, late May, after the U.S. War Department and the U.S. Army realizes that Virginia, south of the Potomac River there, you can see on the map, uh, will indeed uh, secede from uh, the Union. Um, they seize the initiative and, uh, you know, they cross two bridges and use amphibious landings to get down um, to the Alexandria area uh, to occupy northern Virginia. And for the viewers here, I just want people to envision Arlington National Cemetery, the high ground in Arlington, you know, the, the Lee Mansion, uh, the Arlington House and just think about that view of the national capital from Northern Virginia. Uh, that was the great fear for the army is that the Confederacy would roll up artillery and shell the capital. And so they seized the initiative to occupy the high ground and they'll, um, it will remain in U.S. control for the remainder of the Civil War. And so the army constructs about a half dozen fortifications late May, June, into July of 1861. But remember, it's the beginning of the Civil War. And for the U.S. Army, they hope it's the end of the Civil War. And, you know, the Army under Irvin McDowell leaves um, the defenses of Washington, or excuse me, leaves D.C., crosses over the Potomac River. Uh, you know, I've, and they use the fortifications to secure the high ground, all the roads into the capital from Virginia. And then, you know, a concentration point for troops and supplies. And then they're, they're going to march into the field and hopefully defeat the Confederate Army and then end the war. As we know, uh, with the first battle of Bull Run, Manassas on uh, July 21st, that does not happen. And the army comes streaming back to Washington. Uh, and General Scott says, retreat to the protections of the fort's guns. Uh, so that the defenses of Washington are already you know, in service. And then by late July, George McClellan will arrive to command of the Department of the Potomac, which becomes the Army of the Potomac. And really under his leadership, uh, especially with U.S. Army engineers, the Army will construct and design an elaborate system of fortifications to encircle the national capital. And it's based on three major strong points. As I mentioned, we've got uh, Arlington. They called it the Arlington Line, which stretched all the way down to Alexandria. This was a zone of immediate threat. Uh, to the north on the D.C. Maryland border was the northern defenses. This is where the Battle of Fort Stevens will take place, which we'll talk about. And to the east, uh, along the Anacostia River, we call it today, they called it Eastern Branch. This was the Eastern Branch line. So these are uh, basically three major zones. They would also describe it as the defenses north of the Potomac and south of the Potomac River. And by the end of 1861, there were already 48 forts that encircled the capital. Pretty dramatic, mounting hundreds of artillery pieces, interconnected by earthworks or rifle trenches, um, fully supplied by military roads that encircled the capital as well. And one of the th really th interesting things about the defenses of Washington, which I share with people, is they seem static, right? Fortifications seem static, um, but they're actually, um, they evolve considerably during the war, and they evolve according to what happens on the battlefields around them. So, as I mentioned, after First Bull Run, you have about 48 forts going up around the capital by the end of 1861. In 1862, you'll see a dramatic expansion of the defenses um, after the Northern Virginia campaign, right? So Second Bull Run, Chantilly, and then Lee's invasion of Maryland um, in September, which leads to, obviously, Battle of South Mountain, of course, the Battle of Antietam. And that's when U.S. Army engineers realize, oh, no, you know, the, the attack will likely come from the north. And that's what they're going to see two years later in 1864. And... You know, so it's called Fortress Washington and, you know, every major road approach to the Capitol uh, was basically defended by a strong point. Multiple fortifications separated by eight to a thousand yards apart, fully connected by earthworks, 
supported by artillery batteries, made D.C. one of the most heavily fortified cities in the world. Uh, we believe it was the most heavily fortified city in the Western Hemisphere. By 1863, 1864, there's over 60 forts that encircle the capital. And by 1863, they're mounting 100-pound Parrot rifles. And in total, over seven to 800 artillery pieces, including mortars as well. Uh, you can see this is looking north into Maryland. Uh, so this is the countryside, right? This is um, the area uh, which the Confederate Army will be um, advancing from, from Frederick, Maryland, or the Battle of Monocacy after uh, July 9th, 1864. And this is pretty cool. This is Fort Totten. Uh, and this gun will be in action during the battle here. So you just see... Uh, the uh, dramatic kind of evolution of, of the defenses of Washington. And this is one of my favorite images because it shows, you know, these 100 pound parrot rifles were not mounted in 1861. They weren't mounted in 1863. You start seeing these in 63 and early 1864. We have to talk about, you know, so I'm going to really move forward with what happens in 1864. So we can have like Q and A and things like that, uh, Stephen. Uh, so there were, Threats, obviously, to the capital. Uh, the U.S. Army maintained a garrison of up to thirty-five to 40,000 men in 1862, 1863. Think about this. During the Battle of Gettysburg, there were over 35,000 soldiers in the defenses of Washington. You can imagine the field commanders like George Meade, obviously before him, George McClellan, Ambrose Burnside. They wanted some of these troops, but they maintained a permanent garrison in the defenses of Washington, uh, that all changes in 1864, as we know, with the promotion of General Grant to Lieutenant General and uh, uh, General in Chief of all U.S. Armies, uh, and he's going to start stripping the defenses of Washington of the, of the garrison, especially heavy artillery regiments. In March, April, May of 1864, they're going to be participating in the Overland Campaign, serving with the Army of the James, serving with the Army of the Potomac, and in their place will be other soldiers. Uh, but this also shows you know, the evolution of U.S. war policy as well, especially with Abraham Lincoln. You know, he was the one that wanted a permanent garrison in D.C. And Grant told him, as previous commanders had said as well, the best way to defend the Capitol is to go on the offensive. And one of the kind of the analogies I like to use when I was working in D.C. with visitors is, you know, it's 1864. It's an election year. Lincoln knows that uh, the war is becoming you know, long and dreary, and it's costing the U.S. Treasury a lot of money. And the American public want to see some some success on the battlefield, major success, uh, with hope that the war can be ended by the end of 1864. And so I make the analogy that Grant, Lincoln, they push all the chips in the center of the table, and they're going to launch these multiple offensives all over the country, uh, including advancing towards Richmond in multiple directions, right? But that that includes removing troops from the defenses of Washington and backfilling them with uh, rear echelon troops, right? And I'll talk about some of the units that were involved in the defense of the, um, during the battle um, as we move forward in the program here. But the Confederate Army responds as well, especially after the Overland Campaign when Lee's army is going to be pinned against Richmond and Petersburg, then uh, the critical rail junction about 20 miles south. After Grant crosses the James River, uh, Lee's running out of time. He realizes this. So he's going to send Juba early west um, to secure Lynchburg and down the Shenandoah Valley, and he's going to cause quite a bit of havoc. So I love using this map here. Uh, you can see Washington, D.C. You can see the rich, uh, Richmond, the Confederate capital, where 100 miles separated. There's a lot of battles and, unfortunately, deaths that will occur between that space in the summer of 1864. But you see this route that Jubal Early takes in red. Um, it goes west, Charlottesville, Lynchburg. There's a, a battle occurring between David Hunter and John Breckinridge. Uh, Breckinridge um, is supported by Early. They drive... David Hunter out of Lynchburg. They even drive him completely out of the Shenandoah Valley, which you see the line headed north there. And then early joined by uh, Breckenridge has an unopposed march down the Shenandoah Valley, which is absolutely incredible. David Hunter with the army of West Virginia was supposed to be there to secure that area. He's gone. And so uh, in middle of June, towards the end of June into early July, you can see 
early marches down the Shenandoah Valley, which means he's going north unopposed. Um, and towards the end of the month, you're going to see really civilians, railroad people make reports that there's a large Confederate force advancing towards the Potomac River. And it causes not as much of an alarm as you would expect. Grant believes that David Hunter is in the valley, so there's no issues there. Um, that's not the case. And so uh, around 4th of July, uh, Early's men will cross the uh, Potomac River after a short skirmish uh, at Harper's Ferry. And they're going to be advancing basically east along southern Mar Maryland. They're going to be ransoming towns and things like that. <laughs> And there will be uh, one major battle that occurs on July 9th called the Battle of Monocacy, right outside of Frederick, Maryland, on the Monocacy River. Uh, U.S. forces will be led by General Lew Wallace, who understands what's going on. And he's the only force uh, between Washington and the Confederate Army. It's a relatively uh, inexperienced group of soldiers, uh, you know, Potomac Home Guards and uh, National Guard troops and things like that. Um, and he's going to try to basically buy as much time as possible. By this point, General Grant, the War Department in D.C. realized that uh, there's a large Confederate force advancing towards the Capitol, and they're going to use their interior lines, um, <clears throat> the James River, Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac River, uh, to transport troops, veteran troops of the Sixth Corps from the Army of the Potomac to get to the Capitol, secure the Capitol, reinforce the Capitol. The question is, will they get here in time? You can see there's a line that goes all the way to Baltimore. That's the third division of the Sixth Corps under James Ricketts. They'll arrive in time to reinforce Lou Wallace. And they, uh, along with Wallace's, who makes a tremendous stand, this is Lou Wallace's great redemption. Uh, they fight about eight hours along the um, along the Monocacy River, delaying um the Confederate Army by one full day. And I use another analogy. I, you know, you have a, a prize boxer, which is the Confederate Army under Juba Early, a bunch of veterans, uh, and they take a, a punch in the first round from Juba, uh, excuse me, from Lou Wallace's guys, and they go, and they go down. Um, eventually, the champion gets up, and, you know, he's going to start using his experience to basically win the fight. Uh, by the evening time, that U.S. force is driven off the field and they retreat towards Baltimore and there's no one left between uh, the Capitol and the Confederate Army who will make their advance towards D.C. on July 10th. As I mentioned, it's really important to understand who's in D.C. Well, you have an elaborate system of fortifications, uh, one of the most heavily fortified cities in the world, but you don't have troops, enough troops. Uh, the garrison that will be defending the Capitol along the northern defenses will be around 10,000 men. And it will be comprised mostly of uh, the Veteran Reserve Corps, formerly the Invalid Corps, which I'll talk about in a second. 100-day National Guard troops, literally men that signed up for 100 days and were not supposed to see major action. Uh, they were supposed to, you know, garrison the forts and guard government property. And they're going to be facing Confederate veterans. Uh, and this is the famous battle where the government arms government clerks and sends civilians to the front line. Uh, the empty hospitals with convalescents uh, arm them and send them to the front. Literally all hands on deck to defend the Capitol. So this is early at the gates. And I think people will appreciate this map of the defenses of Washington towards the end of the, actually at the end of the Civil War, all the fortifications you can see there, the major roads. I want everyone to really focus on the northern defenses here. Uh, there's going to be Confederates coming down the Rockville Road or Wisconsin Avenue today. And then the main Confederate force under Juba Early, the infantry will be advancing from Silver Spring, Maryland, down the 7th Street Road. We, that, we call that today um, Georgia Avenue. And you can see Fort Stevens is built just to, uh, I mean, built literally to defend that major access, north uh, south access point into Washington, D.C. It sits right on top of that road. And it's going to be supported uh, by forts uh, on its flanks, especially Fort DeRussi which has a 100-pound Parrot rifle uh, that you saw at Fort Totten. That fort will be heavily engaged. Uh, that fort will be garrisoned by mostly veteran Reserve Corps troops. Uh, to the east is Fort Slocum, which will be engaged as well. And as I mentioned, you saw that image of Fort Totten with the 100-pound Parrot rifle. Uh, it, it's going to be um, supporting, providing a crossfire. Imagine two 100-pound Parrot rifles providing crossfire um, right on the 7th Street Road. So the Confederate Army will be taking long-range artillery fire three to four miles outside of the, 
even uh, of the Capitol as they advance slowly towards uh, the defenses. Um, but um, U.S. forces commanders realizes that the main access point will be the 7th Street Road. And so that's where the fight's going to be made. And that's where we're going to find William Ray and elements of the Veteran Reserve Corps. And let's talk about them. So think about this map here. The action will occur between Fort DeRussi, Fort Stevens in the middle, and Fort Slocum. So let's talk about the Veteran Reserve Corps. You can see them, an image here of um, a company of VRC troops in, the, um, in Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. So uh, the Veteran Reserve Corps was created by the War Department, General Orders Number 105, on April 28, 1863. It was formally called the Invalid Corps. It was organized to employ soldiers who had been rendered unfit for active service on account of wounds or disease, cat, uh, contracted in the line of duty. Um, but these men were still able to garrison and perform light duty, thus freeing able-bodied men to go to the front. Uh, these men enforced the draft. I mean, they were literally located. I mean, they were stationed across the country. I think when a lot of people think about the it was later um, – excuse me, it was later renamed VR Veteran Reserve Corps in February of 1864 uh, because the soldiers found the name quite demeaning. Um, I think when people think about the VRC that, you know, they were stationed in D.C., which they were, but they were stationed at major cities um, across the country. They were even at Camp Nelson during the Civil War. Um, and you can see here, uh, one of the, the officers uh, has lost an arm. And, um, you know, so there were soldiers... Um, that had seen quite a bit of service here and remained in the army able uh, to free up able-bodied men to go to the front. Uh, and you'll see during this firefight that occurs on July 11th, 12th, uh, members of the VRC perform incredibly capably during the battle, very heroically, and are one of the major reasons why Early is basically, basically blunted um, at the gates of Washington before the arrival of the Sixth Corps. And you can see they're kind of wearing these infamous sky blue shell jackets. So there's Fort Stevens right there. Uh, one of my favorite images of the fort because you see the 7th Street Road in the background that the Confederate Army will be advancing down that road from Silver Spring, Maryland. And as I mentioned, uh, this was lightly garrisoned. There were elements of the VRC, um, the first VRC especially, that will be really um, stationed in the the flanks of the fort, you know, uh, manning the, the rifle trenches that connected to Fort DeRussi and then uh, to the west and Fort Slocum to the east. Um, and there's this company, Company K, 150th Ohio National Guard. They're from Oberlin College. They're college students. Most of them are college students, if believe it or not. And these are going to be some of the defenders um, of, of the forts as Juba Early advances down that road, really in the late afternoon, um, right after 12 noon or so um, of July 11th, 1864. And there's going to be quite a bit of skirmishing uh, north of the fortifications here as the U.S. troops are trying to slow down the Confederate advance towards the Capitol. And, you know, the defenses of Washington were designed so well that Juba Early didn't realize how undermanned they were. You know, he writes this after action report to Robert Lee about a week after the battle. And he, he talks about he describes the defenses as scientifically designed, you know, with interlocking uh, fields of fire, um, forts providing crossfires, especially heavy guns. He's probably talking about 30 pounders to 100 pounders as well. And he didn't realize that they were lightly garrisoned by, you know, veteran reserve corps troops, national guard troops, government clerks, and things like that. So in a way they served as a deterrent to slow down the Confederate army. And it was early to mid July. It was hot. It was humid. His men had been marching for about a month over 300 miles and had fought a major battle on July 9th. All those factors combined to slow down early long enough for reinforcements to arrive. But I think it's critically important to mention um, how well the defenders performed uh, before the arrival of the sixth Corps. So uh, they're going to be marching right down that road here. And these guns are going to roar into action and these defenders will roar into action as well. So here's another great image. And a lot of the images that were taken at Fort Stevens after the battle. So this is in 1865. But you see how open the countryside is. Uh, you see, um, you know, the fortification line here, the earthworks. You see the embrasures and these 30-pound pair rifles. They're going to be 
firing long range ordnance throughout the battle here. And they're dealing with a lot of skirmishing, sharpshooting, you know, they're trying to pick off the gunners at, at the forts and things like that. Um, but as, as I mentioned, especially to the West, um, uh, the Confederates are going to try to get around Fort Stevens uh, through Rock Creek Valley or along Rock Creek, and they're going to run into the VRC troops stationed at Fort DeRussi. And there's going to be quite a bit of skirmishing, heavy skirmishing throughout um, July 11th into July 12th. Re really, really cool image of the site. So let's talk about William Ray. You can see on the right there. And so William Ray was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 16th, 1845, at the outbreak of the Civil War, he was 16 years old and he enlisted with Company F, the 23rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, known as Bernie's Zouaves, commanded by Colonel and later Major, Major General David B. Bernie on August 1st, 1861. And ironically, like a lot of troops that served in the Army of the Potomac, uh, the regiment was sent uh, to reinforce the capital, uh, part of the expanding the defenses of Washington for the remainder of the year before embarking on uh, campaigns with the Army of the Potomac in 1862. Uh, so the 23rd Pennsylvania was lightly engaged at the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862. It was assigned the task of uh, basically guarding a bridgehead in the center of General Ambrose Burnside's line. And the regiment reported only two casualties, Patrick Hickey, who you can see on the left of the sketch there, um, and William Ray, uh, who were supposedly wounded by the same mini ball. And you can see... Uh, Ray's wound was serious, uh, was serious as the ball went through his eye. According to historian Frank Riley, the one of the rangers and historians at Fredericks Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania County um, National Military Park, who told me that Ray was likely wounded in the initial skirmishing on December 12th or incidentally in the artillery barrage on December 13th. So after the war, the veterans formed the Survivors Association, 23rd Corps Regiment, Pennsylvania Infantry, Ray was elected as a secretary and assigned the task of compiling the regimental history that was published in 1904. Incredibly, Ray does not provide any detail of the wound he suffered in the Union history. Uh, but that was after the war. During the war, his career will continue. Uh, so Ray will spend the winter recuperating in an Army hospital. He remained with the 23rd Pennsylvania through 1863. And according to the regimental history, he was transferred to Company K, First Veteran Reserve Corps on February 14th, 1864. So just a few months before the battle. Um, and I mentioned kind of the history of the VRC here. So let's talk more about them during the battle. Uh, the, as I mentioned, they played a critical role in the defense of the Capitol during the Battle of Fort Stevens. Uh, several units were in, um, engaged in the defense, uh, including the Ver Veteran Reserve Brigade, commanded by Colonel George W. Guile. The brigade consisted of six VRC regiments, the 1st, which Ray was a part of, the 6th, the 9th, the 19th, 20th, and 22nd, and it was attached to Brigadier General Martin D. Hardin's 1st Division, 22nd Corps, which was, he was headquartered at um, Fort Reno in Northwest D.C. And so, as I mentioned, they occupied earthen parapets and that connected the forts and batteries along the length of the defenses. According to the uh, Chief Engineer of the Defenses of Washington, Several additional regiments of veteran reserves and several detachments of dismounted cavalry reported to Major General McCook, who was in charge of the northern defenses, and were posted in the trenches on either side of Fort Stevens. Uh, the defenders engaged the advanced elements of the Confederate Army on July 11th. But as I mentioned, there were major firefights that occurred along Rock Creek to the west at Fort DeRussi and Fort Stevens to the front or the north and Fort Slocum to the northeast, just, just down the road. From Fort, uh, from Fort Stevens. All right, so let's talk about what happens next with Mr. Ray. So you can see here, this is really, really interesting because it mentions his home, you know, his original unit, uh, the Company F 23rd PA Volunteers, but it does not mention that he was with the 1st Veteran Reserve Corps, and that's where he'll be awarded the Medal of Honor. So uh, which he uh, will um, receive years after the battle, but his action will occur on the second day's battle. And um, by this point, the Confederates have really no chance of breaking into DC. Uh, the Ninth Corps arrived at the Potomac, uh, excuse me, the Sixth Corps arrived at the Potomac River around 12 noon. It'll take them a few hours to get to the Northern defenses, but by the evening of July 11th, they are in 
Uh, they have reinforced the northern defensive line, including Fort Stevens, um, and Early has no chance of breaking through. So the next day, July 12th, you'll see a lot of artillery fire. Uh, you'll see a lot of skirmishing uh, along the line. Uh, you know, men are getting picked off and things like that. Um, and let's read Ray's um, citation here. So the president, Benjamin Harrison, of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Sergeant William J. Ray, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism on 12 July 1864, while serving with Company K, 1st Veteran Reserve Corps, in action at Fort Stevens, Washington, D.C., Sergeant Ray rallied the company at a cr critical moment during a change of position under fire, and likely the change of position was, um, you know, the VRC falling out of line and the Sixth Corps filling in uh, that position. Um, the battle will conclude that night when the Sixth Corps launches an attack that drives the Confederate Army out of Washington, D.C. But for Sergeant Ray, he rallied the company at a critical moment during a change of position under fire, and... Um, like a lot of Civil War soldiers, he will not uh, get uh, receive his um, his Medal of Honor for decades. Okay, and so he'll remain in the VRC for another year, and he'll uh, be mustered out of service on November twenty third, eighteen sixty five. He is interred. I'm sorry, he died on June 9th, nineteen nineteen. Uh, you can see it right there. I'm sorry, June first uh, at the age of seventy four, and it was initially interred at. American Mechanics Cemetery. In 1951, the body was disinterred and relocated to Philadelphia Memorial Park for burial with uh, the Ray family plot. And you can see it here today. And I want to acknowledge uh, my friend, uh, Ranger Savannah Rose, who works at Independence National Historical Park, who uh, took these images for me a couple years ago when I was still working for the Defenses of Washington. So you, obviously you can see the, the Medal of Honor um, on uh, the this uh, uh, headstone here. And are on this marker, uh, but that's in honor of William Ray and his service um, during the Battle of Fort Stevens. And I like to say, the Capitol wasn't taken. Right, this is the famous battle on July twelfth, where President Lincoln was under direct enemy fire during the battle. And so, you know, it's um, such an interesting engagement. You know, you've got the president, and then you've got um, elements of the VRC, uh, National Guard troops, government clerks, convalescents everyone there with the purpose to defend the national capital and they did an incredible job and i want to conclude it with uh stephen with this final um post here and um i love this is one of my favorite descriptions uh of the battle of fort stevens and this is by general alexander mcdowell mccook you'll appreciate him formerly of the army of the cumberland right the 20th corps and um He'll be placed temporarily in command of the Northern defenses uh, just, just because of his rank. He'd been a major general since 1862. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he'll be in command for just a few days here. And his description of the, the soldiers and civilians that participated in the defense of the Capitol is quite incredible. You can see an image of that larger image of the VRC there um, at Washington Park in D.C. And let me read it out loud to any, everyone. Um, I regret that I cannot at this distant point recall the names of the commanders of attachments who reported to me, but I may hazard the remark. There was never before a command so heterogeneous, yet so orderly. The hale and hearty soldier, the invalid, the Veteran Reserve Corps, right? The convalescent, the wounded, and the quartermaster's employees side by side, each working with a single, hold on a second, I got to move this, singleness of purpose and willingness to discharge uh, discharge and duty imposed upon them like i think that's just a perfect description of what this battle was all about so um appreciate you let me talk about the defenses of washington the battle of fort stevens and of course talking about sergeant william ray medal of honor recipient at the battle of fort stevens thank you so much my friend man what a ride that one was man you know I guess I didn't realize, I mean, obviously the capital of our country is very, very important and needs to be defended, but I had no idea that it, by the end of the war, it was uh, primarily those that were convalescing, uh, the veterans uh, from previous engagements, and also the, the employees. I had, I, I had no idea uh, yes. the civilians were also involved in the, you know, helping defend the city, but it, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, it does. And, you know, there's a 
a lot that can be said about, you know, the American spirit to protect, uh, you know, our capital, because uh, we had seen it attacked previously. Absolutely. Uh, yes. We, we definitely didn't want that happening again. And so all of these forts are are spectacular in size, uh, in in design. It, it's it's amazing that and I'm very thankful that that there are people like you that that help preserve that um, that history for our country. Uh, well, I'm ready and open uh, and willing to have some questions come in. It looks like we've got uh, a we've got one so far. What is the final say on the Lincoln under fire story? <laughs> That's a, quite a bit of back and forth. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we get that question a lot. I would mention really quickly, though, um, that Ray was awarded the Medal of Honor on December 15th, 1892. So almost 30 years after the battle. So thankfully, he did receive that before. He passed away and he lived for quite some time, right? 1919 was when he passed away. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, there are so many counts of Abraham Lincoln um, at the Battle of Fort Stevens and he's present, right? Um, throughout the city uh, during this, you know, this campaign, really, it's uh, as Dr. Benjamin Franklin Cooling, one of the experts on the defenses of Washington says, it's one evolution after another, right? With the Valley campaigns and the campaigns around uh, the Capitol and, and things like that in 1864. And Lincoln, you know, goes from the White House up to Lincoln's cottage uh, near Fort Totten. Uh, and, and, you know, according to some of the accounts I read, that he wants to be present because he wants, uh, especially the civilians, to realize that, that everything's going to be okay, right? He doesn't want to sh um, strike panic um, in um, uh, the civilians. As, you know, especially as the Confederate Army advances from Maryland, there are refugees that are coming into the city. So they know what's going on, right? And uh, I think there's two accounts. I mean, there's confirmations we believe of Lincoln that Lincoln was at Fort Stevens both days. Um, I, I, for a short time, we believe on July 11th, as there was some skirmishing starting to occur at Fort Stevens around 12 noon. Uh, that's when the message is sent to, um, to Fort Stevens from, you know, the center of the cap, uh, Capitol from the war department headquarters uh, that the sixth Corps had right off the, had arrived off the Potomac Wharf or had arrived on the Potomac Wharf. And then, uh, Lincoln, we believe, you know, is escorted down to the Potomac River and welcomes the soldiers of the Sixth Corps. And you can imagine c the civilians, citizens in town are elated that, you know, the, the saviors are here. Right. And they know it's the veteran Sixth Corps. Right. These men had seen a lot of action before. And by the way, some of these Sixth Corps soldiers had built some of the forts. And so they were mm -hmm. back. Right. I mean, literally a couple years later or a few years later. And um, there's this really incredible account where. You know, Lincoln's talking to the soldiers and he tells them, you know, if you run into any Confederates, tell them this is, uh, you know, just the this is just the beginning of the, you know, this is just um, a portion of the reinforcements that have been sent to the Capitol, that there were more troops on the way and things like that. And, you know, I think some soldiers reported we call this the Lincoln dad joke related to the defenses of Washington. Right. That you know, he tells soldiers that you can't be late if you want to get early and, you know, they all go crazy and things like that. Right. So I love to share that story. Um, and then the sixth core that, you know, they got a, a, a couple hours to go or a few hours to make it up to the Northern defenses. As I mentioned that night, um, you know, it's pretty much over for early, you know, he can't really break through, but it's hard to retreat in the face of an enemy. And there's more um, reinforcements on the way elements of the 19th core are arriving and will be arriving over the next week or so actually. Um, like a lot of commanders, you know, Juba Early holds a council of war and he wants to determine what happens next. And, you know, he makes this point that he rides out the next morning and he saw all these flags along the line of the fortifications and he realized it was too late. Um, as I mentioned, uh, from both perspectives, there's going to be a lot of skirmishing the remainder of the day. Uh, General McCook says that he's going to basically use artillery to drive the Confederate Army out of the capital. That does not happen. Um, and so that's why that evening there's going to be a a six core attack, literally a, a frontal assault with infantry that would drive the Confederate army out of the Capitol. And that's where the majority of the uh, casualties will uh, be sustained is during this firefight uh, on the evening of July 12th. Uh, but before that happens, Lincoln arrives back at Fort Stevens. We believe he's with like Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. We believe he's with Mary Todd Lincoln, uh, Lincoln, and perhaps you know, a, a couple of the cabinet members are, you know, greeted at the fort and they're welcomed in. Um, at that point, General Horatio Wright, commanding the Sixth Corps, is at Fort Stevens, and he invites Lincoln to basically observe the battle, which is 
crazy, right? But <laughs> wants to see what's going on, right? And and the thing was, Lincoln was under fire. And I think it's important to recognize that because, I mean, the Sixth Corps, they put up a marker, right? And I saw that image of that gentleman, you know, portraying Lincoln. That, that That's marker is for, you know, president under fire because uh, there was a, a Sixth Corps surgeon that was standing next to the, uh, to the president that was severely wounded in the leg. He gets hit and he goes wow. down. And that's when people are like, get down, <laughs> get down, you fool, get down, you damn fool. As you can imagine, there were many people that claimed to tell Lincoln to get down, you fool, including, you know, the future Supreme Court justice. And so I don't think it was, I believe it was Horatio Wright. I think he provides um, the best, um, most accurate account of that incident of getting Lincoln out of um out of Fort Stevens, but he was there. Apparently he enjoyed, you know, observing what was going. I think he was kind of caught up in the moment. Um, so, um, but th yeah, that, that was, that, that was there. I mean, Lincoln was there um, and he was under fire. So um, it's really, really interesting to, you know, we've been kind of, I spent a, quite a bit of time just trying to research this. Um, so I wanted, you know, it was Oliver Wendell Holmes that has been credited with, with telling Lincoln to get down you fool. You know, we, we found some research that said, you know, like that wasn't really mentioned until like, you know, close to his death. So who knows? I think it's Horatio Wright. You know, they get into this um, kind of interesting conversation where, you know, Wright tells them, you know, for your safety, I need you to to leave the fort. Um, and I think Lincoln tells him, well, I'm, I'm the commander in chief. And he's like, I understand that, sir, but I'm in command of this line. And, you know, for the safety of this country, we need to remove you from the fort. So, right. uh, yeah, they get him out of the fort and they ask him, uh, escort him all the way back to, um, the, uh, to the White House. And if I recall, I think he tells, you know, one of his military press secretaries that, uh, he, you know, he saw the battle and they were they were shocked. <laughs> so. Uh, Lincoln, Fort Stevens, um, they're indel indelibly linked as they should be. So if you make um, a visit to D.C. today, I, I suggest going to see it. Um, Fort Stevens is really interesting. It was pretty much destroyed after the Civil War. There were remnant earthworks left by the early 1900s. Uh, the land was preserved um, um, by an African-American woman, Elizabeth uh, Thomas. And, you know, she um, she was able to purchase, you know, this we believe it was the land that her family had owned before the civil war. And then she was able to sell portions of it to this uh, a preservation group that was, uh, that basically maintained the battlefield because there was so much urban growth around um, the fortifications, right around DC in general. Um, and, and believe it or not in the 1930s, 1937, 1938, the civilian conservation Corps rebuilt a section of Fort Stevens. And that's what you see today. That's and it was actually, uh, yeah, it was, it's incredible. And it's really, it was actually under the supervision and the planning of like the uh, national park service, like DC, like our ar architect. Um, and it still stands today. It's actually really, really cool. And up the road, by the way, uh, about a half mile is battleground national cemetery where over 40, uh, about 39 us soldiers from the battle, um, of Fort Stevens are buried at. So that's, that's wild. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure standing there as Lincoln is looking over and seeing the battle happening, I'm sure he could have gotten lost in the caught up in the moment, right? You know, seeing that amount of men uh, trying to make it into your capital, like right? It, I'm sure it is a, a moment to that you sh probably shouldn't pause right. at, but it, it, and, and, and I mentioned as well, you know, Lincoln is Lincoln, right? Especially after his death in '65, right? He was, you know, he's sanctified in many ways. And so you can imagine there's like every single soldier and civilians basically report. I saw Lincoln you know, at the battle. Right. And, you know, like one unit might be like a mile away from the board. Right? We saw Lincoln. Right. It's kind of interesting. But, you know, I, I, again, I, I advise people to go, go check out Battleground National Cemetery. It, it is um, uh, managed by, and administered by the National Park Service. And um, there's four U.S. monuments along the road there, right? R right along mm -hmm. the road as you walk into the cemetery. I mean, it's, 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 in the, it's in the cemetery. It's one of the smallest national cemeteries in the country. It's about one acre in size. Oh, wow. And there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's so much, you know, it's, it's super unique. The, the lodge was designed by Montgomery Meigs, the quartermaster general. And, and Meigs is going to be in charge of the, uh, of the civilian, you know, quartermaster employees during the battle, right? Yeah. One of the volunteers civilian volunteers is buried at the cemetery he was mortally wounded actually he was hit by like a, a round like an artillery and 
died, right? And um, so there is a, a civilian that volunteered to, uh, to basically serve during the battle that was killed, and deservedly so. You know, we, they, they they honored him by burying him at the cemetery. Wow. But there's uh, four monuments um, along you know along um, basically the frontage of the cemetery there, 25th. Uh, New York Cab, <clears throat> 98th Pennsylvania, 122nd New York, and then the Company K, uh, Ohio National Guard, you know, the, uh, the Oberlin College students. And, you know, the language on the monuments is really interesting, right? And yeah. you know, one of them says, <clears throat> in the defense of the Capitol, in the presence of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> okay, so they specifically wrote that it was in the presence of Abraham Lincoln. That's That's saying something, right? Yeah, like yeah. The 122nd New York monument. It's, it's absolutely incredible to see it. Right. And so but I love how they had to throw in there in the presence um, of, of of Lincoln, you know, so. Makes sense. Uh, we got another question. Uh, how many of the remaining defense fortifications around the district have you had the opportunity to visit? Oh, that's a great question. And I, I think um, well over. I, I, I mean, and that includes like earthworks, like we're just talking about like a rifle trench, right, or something. Yeah. Um, we're talking about artillery batteries that are, that are in the woods of Rock Creek, and are, <laughs> some of them are in private property. Like uh, one of the best remnant earthworks is a, a, a artillery battery, so basically unclosed fortification position, and it's uh, on the property of the a Peruvian ambassador to the United <laughs> States. And it's amazing. Oh, it's, it, you, we had to get permission to go out there. It's spectacular. It's called Battery Terrell. And that's actually a, a Kentucky connection where I'm at now, right? Terrell was killed at the Battle of Perryville in October oh. of 1862. Uh, but there's a, a, literally this this huge earthwork in front of this in this incredible like 1920s mansion, right? And so um, the Park Service manages basically 17 sites. Um, and, you know, they're urban parks, right? And so if you hear like, Fort uh, Slocum, for instance, it's it's just a green space, right? Yeah. Um, if you go through the woods there. <clears throat> you 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 you'd want to be with one of us, right? We've got maps and things like that. We've done the lidar, um, so we know where some of the remnant earthworks are. As my dear friend and mentor David Lowe would say, he's the one that mapped them. He's the earthwork expert. He just recently retired from the Park Service. And I, I remember walking, I was looking for this battery. I'm like, I cannot find this battery. And he's like, if you squint your eyes, you might be able to see it. Right. So <laughs> I kept on walking by it. Right. And yeah. obviously, the best time to see it is like in the dead of winter when you, the foliage is down, you can see things like that. Right. Um, but the Park Service manages like 17 major sites um, and then the, the National Cemetery as well. Uh, but there are earthworks scattered all over the place. Um, and it's, it's hard to believe, right, that D.C. has all these remnant earthworks, but they're still there. Right. Wow. So yeah. some are on private property. Some are on uh, federal lands. And there's great sites in northern Virginia as well. Right. So Arlington County Parks and Rec manages some really great Civil War sites. Uh, Fort Ethan Allen and Fort C. F. Smith. I would suggest going to Fort C. F. Smith. There's a there's a visitor center there actually. And we worked pretty closely with them, um, and so they they've got some earthworks, some two major earthworks, but some remnant earthworks as well. And then I, I think um, you know um, the, the best preserved earthwork is is, is in Virginia at um, man. Oh my gosh, it's 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 um, it's completely going up. I lost it in my mind right now, but I'll mention it if it comes up in a second, but uh, there's actually quite a bit uh, to see here. And I, I hope, um, you know, if, if you make a trip to DC, you know, um, there's a lot, there's plenty of information online uh, and you can find um, a lot of these sites um, and go out and explore them. There, there, there's a lot to see. Now to, to bring it back around to uh, William Ray, uh, yeah. how, how is Ray remembered? Uh, is he remembered at Fort Stevens, is he remembered in in Pennsylvania? Like, are there markers? Uh, do we know if any family uh, exists, uh, uh, to your knowledge? I don't. The thing is, and that's why I thought this program, Stephen, was so important. Is um, no, I have not found anything um, right. And I, I know there's been talk uh, amongst like the you know the the, the partner group to the the National Park Service called the Alliance to Preserve the Defenses of Washington, there, that there might be a, a hope, perhaps one day a, a marker placed at Fort Stevens for William, where he certainly deserves it, right? But there needs to be something out there to to honor, um, you know, his service during the battle there. Um, and I, I think 
not only for obviously his extraordinary heroism as you know as his citation called for but it's also to honor the veteran reserve corps as well right i mean a lot of these men were uh, disabled because of serious wound and, and active campaigning right and they um they really really deserve um that that recognition for the service that they performed you know because in many ways they were mal maligned for the uniforms they were for the the term invalid corps right which some people use like inspected condemned right so mm -hmm. if you read the after uh the the u.s uh war department kind of reports after the war that they talked about one of the most momentum uh most momentum uh most momentous things that happened was that the name changed in february 64 to veteran reserve corps right um and so i'm hoping there will be something to you know to honor them and obviously william ray um at Fort Stevens. And I, I don't know much about his family life, to be honest. You know, I, I was, I was really fortunate, as I mentioned, to have, um, my friend, a, 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 a MPS Ranger in Philadelphia. I'm like, Hey, uh, and I think that I, you know, I wrote a post for the defenses a couple of years ago, and I think it might've been 2019 or something. I'm like, Hey, do you mind going to the cemetery yeah. and taking the photos of the cemetery? Right. It, as I mentioned, isn't it interesting? It doesn't mention the VRC on his, on his marker. Yeah, at all, right? because, and yeah. And as I'm sitting here thinking about it, you know, and I know our viewership and our and our members of the of the Heritage Center, you know, we we would love to have him recognized as well right. at the fort. Uh, so if there's any kind of campaign that we can be a part of, uh, you know, definitely shoot it towards yeah. us, and we will make sure that our uh, listeners, our viewers, uh, social media followers can can yeah. get involved with it as well. Right. But it, but it would be interesting to find out why the vrc wasn't mentioned right especially done. since that's what he you know th that's who he received the medal of honor with i get yeah. it you know, as i mentioned he was a part of like the 23rd corps like you know veteran survivors and all that he was mm -hmm. instrumental in the um he was the secretary as you said yeah right? exactly you know part of the publication of the regimental history as well which makes sense I, clearly he was deeply connected to yeah. this, his original home regiment so i think that makes a lot of sense well, but and a lot of recipients, you know, modern day recipients living in and also from interviews from uh, past recipients that have uh, passed on, you know, they say that the medal represents, you know, the guys that didn't get recognized. Oh, and interesting. So, right. You know, right. It, okay. and it's an interest. It would be a great way to both recognize Ray and also the VRC that helped defend the right the capital, uh, at and, a very pivotal moment in the war. And remember, like he was missing an eye during the action. Right. Yeah. So, incredible what he was able to do during, the, during that battle and i i'll mention really quick it was it's fort ward that's in virginia that has an incredible visitor center museum and the best reconstructed earthworks in the entire system so if people have a chance go and visit that site it's tr truly the premium uh defense of a washington site and uh, they do tremendous work down there and they have been for decades uh but you know and i think this is a, a testament to the battle as well right i, I think you know there was uh, there was not much that happened during the battle. There was enough that happened, right? Yeah. Um, uh, enough for, you know, Lincoln to be at the action, enough for Grant to send up the entire Sixth Corps, one division to Baltimore, two divisions directly to Washington, D.C., elements of the 19th Corps as well. And remember, they these units, these corps remain in that area until the end of 1864, wow. right? Because you're going to have the battle that occurs a week later at Cool Spring uh, by the end of the month. You know, you're going to have the burning at Chambersburg as well, which incenses Lincoln and the War Department and his cabinet. And so what happens, Grant sends up Phil Sheridan to command all the troops in this area, the army, you know, the middle military department, they call it. He organizes the army of Shenandoah and him and early are going to duke it out for the remainder of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. And these are all the troops that got sent up. Right. The, the elements of the Sixth Corps. Um, the 19th Corps, I mean, obviously Grant will set up cavalry with him as well. Uh, the Army of West Virginia reappears at the at the end of this, uh, like a, a week after the Battle of Fort Stevens. Hey, we're back, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, 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 that's, I think it's important that, you know, the battle ends and then it goes on, right? The campaign mm -hmm. continues. And, um, you know, it, as, I, as I mentioned, it's another evolution, right? But, you know, to the men of the Veteran Reserve Corps, it's incredible what they were able to do. The government clerks were involved, right? Uh, I wanted to mention it as well. Company K, you know, 150 of the Ohio National Guard, mostly college students. Uh, the first soldier, uh, one of the first soldiers to wounded on the skirmish line was 20 years old. I mean, wow. you have young men out there, you know, that were not expecting to see like active service, like, you know, frontline active service yeah. like this. Um, and he gets wounded. Um, 
between like we, we believe Fort Stevens and Fort Slocum was named William Leach. And he died a day after the battle and his father comes and retrieves his body. Right. And so the fact that this unit that was only around for 100 days has a monument at Camp Nelson. I mean, I'm sorry, has a monument at the Battleground National Cemetery means something. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, there, there's so many different connections that you can make just from this one action. Right. And uh, one of our interns just discovered this soldier that a private in Company K. I went on the Oberlin, uh, you know, kind of website that they had with all their history, you know, um, and they were talking about Company K and they had the list of the roster. Right. And a lot of these guys, they would say student uh, for this one gentleman. They could not figure out if he was a student or not, um, but he serves literally 100 days. All these guys, Stephen, are mustered out in, in August, by the way. And in 1865, he gets a commission uh, as a lieutenant in the 5th U.S. Colored Cavalry, which is organized at Camp Nelson. Right. And yeah. then the next year he gets um, transfer or he actually uh, gets another commission and serves in the sixth U S colored cab, which was also organized at Camp Nelson. Right. So from Ohio to the defenses of Washington to Kentucky, and then he muster, he musters out in Arkansas. Right. Imagine seeing all this in the span of about two years. That's, right. That's wild. Oh, so, um, and you know, that goes back, you know, we'll conclude with William Ray, right. Serves with this veteran, 23rd Pennsylvania, you know, Bernie Zouaves gets wounded, loses an eye, is, a, you know, is in a hospital for a while, gets assigned to the vet, first VRC um, and, um, you know, sees this action. And if you read the reports from all the officers, all of them praise the VRC for their service during the battle. Right. I mean, these are a lot of these are battle hardened veterans. Right. And they were at the right place at the right time with their. Um, steadfast cur uh, courage and determination to, de to defend the Capitol. And it's, it's our duty to honor men like William Ray, right? I wholeheartedly agree. Well, uh, we are getting near the end. Uh, is there anywhere that you would recommend our viewers go to learn more about uh, either Camp Nelson sure. or, uh, yeah, Camp sure. Stevens or the defenses of Washington? Sure. As I mentioned, you know, um, Pretty simple with the defenses of Washington. I, I would just look up, you know, just do a search online, Civil War Defenses of Washington. You'll see the MPS Arrowhead. They've got a website. Um, they've got uh, social media pages and things like that. If you're really interested in, in reading about the fortifications, um, there's a book called Mr. Lincoln's Forts by Dr. Benjamin Franklin Cooling Jr. and Wally Owen, who are two friends of mine. We call it the Fort Bible, by the way. It's got the <laughs> blueprint of all the forts, the units that were um, – uh, you know, that were stationed there. but And also there's like a driving tour as well. It, it'll let you know if there's anything left, right? As you can imagine, a lot of the forts were, you know, or were, were destroyed after the war, right? Um, yeah. So especially the ones in Northern Virginia, you know, there's a building on top of it, but you might be able to find a historic marker out there. Virginia's done a really good job with that. Um, and so, as I mentioned, if you end up going to DC, check out Fort Stevens, um, check out uh, Battleground National Cemetery, um, Northern Virginia, check out Fort C.F. Smith, uh, Fort Ethan Allen under Arlington County Parks and Rec. And um, yeah, go uh, check out the best preserved earthwork, um, Fort Ward with the museum, reconstructed earthworks. Um, and if you want to do research as well, they've got quite a bit of a, a research database there. And then for me at, at Camp Nelson National Monument, right? Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, one of the newest National Park Service units. Just look us up as well. We've got a great website, a lot of great, really, really deep history on there. And um, social media pages, Facebook and, and Instagram. And I'd say this as well, Stephen, got to promote the event because it's coming up. Uh, we have our biggest event of the year, uh, calendar year coming up, August 11th, 12th and 13th. It's the 160th anniversary of the Knoxville campaign or the East yep. Tennessee campaign. Uh, General Ambrose Burnside and the Army of the Ohio will launch this campaign from Camp Nelson in August of 1863. And so um, we're commemorating the 160th anniversary. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to be quite the show, right? We've got immersive living history uh, demonstrations and programs, ranger-led tours, children's activities. I mean, literally sunset and sunrise programs, campfire programs. Um, you can imagine I won't be sleeping much that week, but uh, we got a lot going on. And all the information's on our website and our social media pages. So come check us out, okay? Uh, I'll definitely make sure to post that on our pages as well. Steve? It's always a pleasure, sir. Yeah, I am always, I always feel energized after, after hearing you and your presentation. So, well, I appreciate it, my friend. And I think you'll, 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 you'll uh, appreciate this as well. So I, you know, I started sharing, you know, the, the post, uh, this event last night and some of my DC friends are like, 
you can take a ranger away from the forts, but you can't take <laughs> the away from the ranger. And I thought that was hilarious. So uh, that's definitely true. Um, obviously, an honor and a privilege to represent the National Park Service to be here. And then uh, this is for William Wright and the men of the first yep. VRC, uh, and we honor their service. So thank you so much, my friend. Absolutely. On behalf of the National Medal of Honor Heritage Center, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Steve, I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. And y'all, take care. I'm going to get my hair cut now. Take care. There buddy. you go. <laughs> See you later.